Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. This week, we have Rachel O'Shea from Microsoft, who is a senior technical specialist in compliance. Rachel, if you can give a quick introduction about yourself and your experience in the information security space, that'd be great for our listeners. Yeah, thanks so much, Andy and Adam. Um, my name is Rachel O'Shea, as, as Andy mentioned. I've been with Microsoft for just over a year. Uh, prior to joining Microsoft, I worked for a, a compliance partner uh, called Epic Global, uh, who also falls within the e-discovery space. Uh, so I've, I'm a recovering e-discovery practitioner uh, for over a decade and a half. Um, and prior to that, I worked for a very large software development company under their general counsel as a legal ops manager. So a lot of information governance, records management, and uh, a lot of e-discovery. Great. Last week, Adam and I, we chatted about what information security practitioners should think about when they have an application that needs to be either blocked or allowed when someone is accessing corporate data on it or on a corporate machine, perhaps. And one of the things that came up was when you are uploading corporate data to unmanaged corporate applications. For example, casual data exfiltration or on purpose to unsanctioned cloud storage applications or communication applications like Slack or Discord that don't have enterprise agreements. And we alluded to maybe a different way of protecting that information. So instead of blocking the app outright, allowing users to have access to that application, but then protecting the data so that wherever it may flow, it might be protected. In this day and age, where we have kind of a zero trust environment, where we have different SaaS applications, people are working from home, you know, what's the recommendation and, and really how do we go from here to have information protected wherever it may flow instead of just outright blocking it and really limiting productivity in that sense? Yeah, and that's a really common question that 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 we get um, and there's a couple of of layers ar around that so we'll we'll probably dive into a couple of them and i think one of the primary functions that that comes into is uh, why do i care about that file uh, what is that file why do i care about it what what damage could it do to me uh, if it were to accidentally or uh, maliciously uh, you know leave my my environment and I think uh, what you were just describing is is the industry uh, is known for what we know as data loss prevention. So you're you're trying to protect the loss of that that data. Um, overarching uh, that um, is sort of the the overall data protection, and and we haven't quite all settled on the right words yet of what we want to call it. So some people use DLP um, or, or data loss prevention as the as a program. Some use data protection. Some use other nomenclature. So in the instance of, of what we're talking about today, so data loss prevention, um, the way that, that Microsoft really defines it is, is the action of data leaving um, or the action of data going somewhere. So the transportation of, of data versus data protection. Uh, we really define that as protecting the file itself or protecting that location, that site as, as it may be. So as you were talking about that, that exfiltration, that, that would be what we define as, as, um, as DLP. So I'll get into some acronyms now uh, to try and shorten some of this. <laughs> so we, we love our acronyms at Microsoft, so, uh, so I'll use them. But um, so, so DLP is obviously the action of, of that file transferring, but we can layer in protection um, and in particular with that data protection so that if so happened to leave, uh, when it does um, land in the location that it was transporting to, that 
again, there's a, an additional layer based on that data protection of that file that it would need to authenticate. The file would say, hey, you meant to you meant to be reading me. So is it going to authenticate against Azure Active Directory to say, yep, you're who you say you are. And then there's uh, action to say, well, what can you now do? Can I read it? Can I print it? Can I own it? Um, what am I able to do? So there are, as we we define, there there's sort of layers to that protection, and it's not just uh, a click of a switch or, or being uh, putting one policy into place. You really do try and um, talk to our customers around that layered approach. So a couple of interesting things you mentioned in there that I just want to call out for our listeners. Number one, you mentioned this early on in your kind of explanation there, Rachel, you talked about differentiating between different sensitivity levels of documents. And this is a relatively new concept in a lot of aspects of information security right now, where we're doing something similar with, say, Andy mentioned zero trust. So one of the tenets of that is as opposed to giving somebody, say, a wide open connection to do all the things with a single security gate, Let's revalidate that or set different permission requirements depending on what you're getting to. So sensitivity of applications as well. So we think of an idea where I come from a, with a lot of identity background, it's possible in a lot of modern identity tools to set different requirements based on how sensitive is the application you're trying to access. Is this an application to record your time off? Probably not so sensitive. Is this the HR application where you set your direct deposit information? probably pretty sensitive. And I might set different requirements for both of them. And it's a much better experience from a security perspective to be able to do that as opposed to, oh, you just sign on to VPN one time. And once you're on the VPN, you can get to everything. That's that's not as great. And it's kind of the same idea here with, with documents of making that decision on how sensitive is it. And a lot of organizations, when they first have these conversations, and Rachel, I'm sure you've run into this too, they say, well, let's just protect everything. And, you know, we have to talk about why that's not such a good idea. The second thing I wanted to talk about that you alluded to, Rachel, is this idea of defense in depth, which is tends to be more of an information security concept. But you talked about it as well, how in Microsoft parlance, we talk about data loss prevention or DLP as when data is in transit, when it's moving. And you talked about data protection as more applying it to documents for data at rest. And some people might try to distill this down to one's better than the other, but in reality, what you really need is both. And that gives you that defense in depth strategy where if one system were to fail for whatever reason, you have another gate, another checkpoint that might potentially also stop that data leakage that might come up. And all this to kind of go to the next point of why do we need to evolve our stance on all of these things we're talking about. Why do we need to start thinking about both data loss prevention, information protection, data protection? What are some of the requirements that are driving this from a compliance perspective or security perspective? Yeah, that I mean, that's that's the crux of of, of all of this, um, and the reason why some people, you know, the the if, evolution of the role of records management within organizations um, has turned more into an IT function uh, because we've gone from a very paper-driven world uh, and the concepts are still the same. The, the concept of how do I protect my file, it, it's gone from uh, similar to, uh, to, to networks and, and storage. It's gone to preventing someone from accessing a physical building, accessing a physical um, draw with a key, uh, making sure that key is the only key that opens that one particular file cabinet. Uh, you take those concepts and you apply them exactly the same. Uh, it just so happens to be in the in the cloud and a little bit more technology wrapped around it. But again, you are still layering the defense. Um, you're layering uh, the defense that we applied from a physical paper concept, and now we're also applying that into uh, in, into the the cloud and, and cyber world of of protecting of protecting files. So to, to that sense, there there is this sort of why do we need to evolve? Well, we need to innovate. I wouldn't say we need to evolve. I think there needs to be a little innovation in taking that sound, same foundation of, um, of practice that we used to do and apply those um, to how we're doing it today. Uh, we're still trying to solve the same problem. Uh, we just have a little bit of different mechanisms. And, and quite frankly, um, the with the advancements of, of 
what we're doing in the security world, pulling that into the compliance world allows us to do much more protective things uh, than we could have ever done, like like data encryption. Uh, you know, if someone were to access that file cabinet and pull that that piece of paper out, um, they they can read it. They can read all of it, um, and they can take photocopy of it but then in in the digital world we can now apply encryption to that so think about now putting that through a shredder uh, and then putting it in the file cabinet pull someone pulls that folder out and sees a shredder document and they're like, oh, I can't read that can't do anything with it and um, but until they get that encryption key applied to it now they can read it so so the with the innovations that we've made we have ad advanced the practice of being able to to protect our data and um, but that can be scary for people uh, and so as we talk about, and we'll talk about it next, but as we uh, talk to customers that are going through this journey or, or trying to uh, innovate their, their journey with the digital transformation because they've had, as you alluded to, Adam, um, with certain regulations that have come into play, uh, new regulations that have come into play, certainly from um, and being within the manufacturing uh, vertical within Microsoft, um, you know, a lot of our customers are facing the CMMC challenge, which um, which is it's not no longer a nice to have an information protection program and 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 yeah, we kind of know where our data is. It's it's now a requirement. Like you have to do that. Um, and and a lot of regulations that are coming into play around privacy, around consumer privacy, around employer pri employee privacy, uh, that is no longer a nice to have. That is a requirement um, that that is certainly uh, certainly in there. Rachel, you mentioned CMMC, which is the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification. Can you elaborate a little more on what that is for our listeners who aren't familiar with it? Yeah, so it is a requirement that was pushed down by the, the DOD for those organizations that have a contract uh, with the government. So they, they provide a, a service or a, a particular um, thing, product, uh, that the, the government would utilize and they have that the government contract. So they're, they're taking the NIST requirements um, and then wrapping that around to uh, to really tailor it a little bit more to, to the DOD specialty. Uh, and there's certain tiers uh, over time that an, in, an inv individual organization must achieve to based on their their contract renewal with the government. And so first, that first tier that um, is a part of the CMMC of the first stage is information protection. And so a lot of the conversations that we're having is um, is finding that, that sensitive data, uh, being able to protect it and encrypt it. And that's part of that first stage. Uh, and then as you go through the, the various years of that contract, then there's other um, controls and mechanisms that, that you must uh, respond to. I'm so I personally haven't reviewed it a whole lot. I'm aware of what it is. Is it is it actually kind of a a good framework for an organization to get better with cybersecurity? Is it kind of like a typical kind of government thing where it's really outdated and like bad advice, or is it pretty good? In my opinion, or it's a little where, both. <laughs> yeah, um, yes, it's painful, uh, but quite frankly, as you think about the cyber risks that are hitting us every day, uh, they're in the news. It's it's very, it, it's hit the social media uh, quite extensively, and and so if you think about the risks that are out there, it, you know, it's no longer your neighbor that could affect you. Now you're looking at nation states that are trying to attack, uh, attackers and trying to get our information, um, our intellectual property. Excuse me, which results money. Uh, you've got ransomware attacks, which results money. So it's almost like the new global um, gangsters that, that are attacking that um, that framework. So if you think about the risk, um, you, you think about what um, the controls are within CMMC and some of the other regulations as it relates to data protection, uh, I think it's where everybody should achieve to um, because of the, uh, if you do happen to get um, uh, compromised and an account gets compromised and they start uh, forwarding uh, sensitive documents, again, ba uh, based on that tiered level approach, even if they were to exfiltrate that file, they couldn't read it anyway because you've got that that encryption wrapped wrapped around that that highly confidential file. So, I think as these regulations come through, I think I think yes companies do need to take some time to apply uh, the required controls, but I think long-term it, it's absolutely where organizations should, should get to. Do you think organizations will 
voluntarily aligned to CMMC like they do other standards. I've seen organizations say like, you know, we're implementing the CIS top 20 or we're going to implement this standard. Do you think we'll see that outside of, you know, you might not be a government contractor, you might not have a requirement to do it, but is it potentially a framework we might see other orgs adopt just because it's a good idea? Um, I, 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 yeah, uh, that's a really good question. I, I think it, because CMMC is so targeted towards um, those individual organizations that have contracts or subcontracts to, to the DOD, I think it is a little bit more isolated. But okay. you do see the transverse of, of other, I mean, a lot of the consumer protection, um, privacy, uh, whether they've uh, been implemented in states, uh, there's also this big old million dollar question about whether the federal government will enact a, a federal level uh, data privacy or consumer privacy uh, controls. They all have a component of, of data protection. And so whether companies will follow or say, hey, we follow the CMMC and that becomes a standard for, uh, for the general cause. I don't know whether it will get to that level, uh, but I certainly think from a data protection and what other regulations are including, that will be the baseline. So I just came back to Microsoft and I was at a customer for the last two years and Microsoft Information Protection was one of the things that I helped implement at that company. When you talked about DLP and, and data protection, as a customer, you know, coming from having talked to a lot of vendors, the DLP term often refers to the sensitivity of the data where what's leaving in regards to the content of the data itself. Like it'll match certain uh, data types like social security numbers or PHI or something like that, that is leaving. So it'll scan those documents or data. And then if it fits or matches against one of those types, then it will either block it or do something else to it. Just as an example for some of our listeners, to get a little bit more granular on what Microsoft Information Protection can do, I applied certain basic labels, like um, just a label in itself to show that it is tagged for the organization. Everything was created with a label, but it didn't have any type of data protection on it. It was just a label to just say this is company data. I also applied things that were encrypted that external partners could use and then another label that was specific for internal users. So you had to have an at company.com or internal company.com domain in order to access it through Microsoft. And then we had a read only for confidential stuff. So if, um, if you tagged it with the read only, you couldn't print it. You couldn't screenshot it. You couldn't. Um, you couldn't even save it as a PDF. Try to export it as a PDF. It wouldn't work. And it would also apply a watermark to like a Word document. So those are all like different specific things, examples of what you could do with that. And then I believe there is some integration with the DLP that I'm talking about, where it could scan certain information and then maybe auto classify it. I, I, you can correct me if I'm wrong there, but I think there's a way to do that as well. So, um, yeah, there's there's ways that you can manually classify the sensitivity of that data yourself. And then there's, I think, ways to automate that process as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. You're spot on. Um, and welcome back. <laughs> we we <Thank> missed you. <laughs> you. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, absolutely. And and when we talk to customers around their deployment of of their information protection program, I, I would say ninety percent is is staged in that that sort of project management world of how are we going to deploy this? What does it look like? What do we care about? Um, do we just need to put a label on? on something so we can monitor how it's tracking through the organization and we just want just want a general general label to identify and that's that's sort of the standard label that gets applied so absolutely we can do that and we could go down from that we can go up from that from a priority and, and protection standpoint uh, one of the mechanisms that a lot of our customers utilize um, is as you start 
um, maturing your information protection program, a lot of organizations start small and, um, uh, and simple. Uh, and so get the customers used to or get your employees used to this culture shift of, of protecting, protecting data. And they allow for the manual application of, of, the, uh, of that label. We have policy tips that can come up and, and educate uh, your customers. You can even um, have recommendation as well to say, hey, because this this file contains Project Falcon, uh, which has been identified as a sensitive project type, maybe it's a merger and acquisition project name, uh, we recommend that you flag this as as such, as highly confidential. Um, and then to your point, as they mature through, it's then getting it to a point where we no longer have to rely on the human uh, to to make that, that decision um, and uh, we can auto label uh, that file based on content that's that's present uh, within there, and that sort of goes through that walk, crawl, crawl, walk, run stage of let's let's start small, start simple, get our get our end users used to the different controls, the different labels, what they mean, uh, define them, uh, really change that culture of of the organization to. Um, uh, to really understand why why are we doing this and that's really important as you do roll out a program like this is is making sure your employee base know why why to, why should i care about attaching a a label to a file and going to that that level that's super important as well as well uh, and then going into that utilizing the technology and the advancements in the technology to uh wants to to help with that auto labeling one of the things that really struck home with me as I was working on figuring out those exact things as part of the project management was when you create these labels and the data sensitivity types, not everybody has to have access to each label. For example, our call center, they had a specific use case that they needed to send passwords to external customers. They had a system, they had to create a username and password, and then they had to send that password externally. Well, that's the only use case that they had. So they only needed to use the external label. They had a regular label, and which was auto for all the emails that they sent. And then they had an external label that they would apply when they sent the passwords out. For our executive staff, they had a you know, very specific, um, the board members, where they would have to have only those people could receive emails. So it was just those members of that security group or they would also have the read only if they sent it out. And then they had other nice ones too, like do not reply all. We love that one <laughs> when you send out a do not reply all yep. email or a do not forward email. You could do that as well. So if you have a sensitive attachment, you could flag it as a do not forward and that way you know that it won't be forwarded. So uh, those are, those were little tips that I picked up that you don't have to always give everyone the labels, all the labels, because they may not know what to do with some of them yeah. and they may not even have a use case for it. Yeah, and if you push, uh, so one of the, the phrases I love is don't boil the ocean. I mean, mm -hmm. keep, keep it simple and uh, keep your user groups. And, and what we found really successful is, is create an internal cheerleading for you, uh, for, for, the, for the program. And so get, get those folks that, that are on board with the program and that you can utilize um, and almost deploy them uh, in throughout your organization to um, to, to be that cheerleader uh, and and be that that um, change agent for you. And those are the, the best type of people. So so start with that pilot group uh, and and get them to understand all the different labels, why you would apply this label and you can uh, include that language with when within the label it, itself. Uh, but but then, then start growing, growing that out. And and to your point, Andy, uh, yes, absolutely, you can have different labels for different people. Uh, we certainly do at Microsoft. Uh, so it, it's just a, that's part of that project management um, component of of building your information protection um, program out. Is is where is my biggest risk vector? Um, and uh, if, they, if their files were to be exfiltrated, what is the impact for my organization? Um, and, and then for your general population, where is my biggest risk vector? Uh, and and protecting, protecting that as, as well. There's 
a lot of good advice around how to get started. And Rachel said, don't boil the ocean. That's huge. Uh, you'll see Microsoft has different documentation on suggestions for getting started. A couple other suggestions I'll throw out is initially don't do automatic labeling at all. Just put the labels out there and let people see them. You can have a default. That's fine. But don't don't try to get in their way at first. Just let them kind of get used to it being there. It's kind of like bringing something new home for the dog. Like you just kind of set it there. And if they want to sniff it, they can. If they want to leave it alone, you know, that's fine too. And And then... Don't even do encryption at first. That's another guidance you'll see from Microsoft a lot of time is don't start like encrypting documents and breaking them, breaking workflows right away. Because what we're trying to do, again, we're trying to build change acceptance here. So let people see them, see that they don't really hurt anything. They can try clicking up and down and seeing kind of what it does. And then as you introduce more pieces over time, there's going to be more acceptance because they're going to see like the whole system isn't flawed. Auto labeling is really hard to get right. And if you, if you do have a little bit of a misstep, then you can correct it. Or if you're doing protection and you're adding that encryption and that rights management to the document, and you maybe take that a hair too far, you can course correct and fix that without losing the whole project, without losing confidence in the technology itself. Because a lot of this is understanding the different workflows and use cases and making sure you aligned in them without breaking the ability of your business to do their job, but do it securely and safely. So there's a lot here, but the, Biggest thing is just don't boil the ocean. Start little, grow over time, expand over time. And you can go from there and you'll be a lot more successful if you do it that way. It's funny that you say that, Adam, because I remember the first time that I played with information protection. And of course, as a security professional, I always err on the safer side. <laughs> so my first instinct was let's by default encrypt all my emails. Oh no. And so that's the first thing that I did. And of course, that's not what you want to do because it, it does create a lot of barriers when you start encrypting all your emails and then people are getting, uh, they have to sign in and authenticate to view your email or you can't view the preview on your uh, phone anymore because it says so-and-so has sent you a protected email. And so that's not what you want to do like what Adam said. Maybe don't start with encryption <laughs> by default, <laughs> although... You may want to. I bet you were their best friend for that week. Oh, goodness. <laughs> goodness yes. me. And, and I think that, that brings up a, a, a really good point in in the, the sense that, um, you know, start small, start simple. Uh, don't, don't encrypt immediately. Make sure your business and your organization can still be still be productive uh, because the, the worst thing you want to happen is uh, you, you go out and you're super conservative, everything gets blocked, then nobody's going to use or apply the labels the way that you intend them to do and, and they'll, they'll find ways to, to get around it uh, and now you've got a bigger problem on your hands where you've got a bunch of labeled uh, you know, labeled files that should retain some protection, uh, but now would uh, could potentially get outside of your organization because of that. So by through that change management, you're changing that culture, you're changing that, that mindset. Um, and you also want to make sure that this is an iterative process. This isn't a set it and forget it. Um, it's not like your crock pot with your with with your stew going on. It it is literally something you need to check back in with. Uh, as as Microsoft's evolved uh, the different data types and your organization changes how they communicate and how you collaborate. And I think this past 18 months has has proven that that can happen really quickly. Uh, and you need to be able to understand how that collaboration is working now. Uh, and so it may not be, you, you may be having new risk vectors entered in because <coughs> now your organization is transitioning into using a, a different platform, uh, a different arena to communicate about certain certain things that you that weren't happening a year ago, two years ago, and, and you need to keep up with that. So for those organizations that, that have their policies, uh, we also recommend doing a yearly check-in with those, uh, make sure, and there's um, tools available within within the compliance center within M365 that allow you to see that activity, allow you to see the, 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 the various labels, how uh, reports that are on, how people are manually tagging, are they auto labeling, uh, are they uh, up, um, 
uh, up labeling or downgrading labels, uh, what their justification is for overriding. That is all being tracked. Um, and that's definitely something as you go through your program, uh, if you have an established program, uh, check in with your rules, check in with your policies. Are these, are these still um, applicable? Are they outdated? Uh, do we need to tweak them a little bit to now include teams, to now include sites? Do we want to protect a site, not just the file? Uh, so there's, uh, and as, as the tools um, evolve as well, uh, there's also, you know, new features that come in. So it is a, I say it's job security uh, for sure. Uh, and, and to make sure that just because you have your policy and just because you have the rules in place and you have your labels, you're, you're not done. Um, and you need to keep, keep track of that as your organization grows um, because it is a living, living breathing organism. Rachel, is it a fair expectation for somebody to think they can get to a point when automation will label everything for them and humans never need to just pick a label on their own? Oh boy, I knew you were going to ask this one. Um, so uh, where AI comes into the our world, no. <laughs> yeah, uh, artificial intelligence, augmented intelligence, however you want to define it, uh, there always has to be a human interaction. There always has to be uh, human intervention uh, in into that that nature um, with sentiment analysis uh, progressing and um, and decision making and, and and bots making those decisions. You still need a human to to create those algorithms, uh, but also to intercept uh, when when things go. Uh, when think people start changing the way they communicate, um, and the the technology hasn't hasn't been um, uh, changed to, to account for that, uh, so no, uh, it surely will help. Um, I think uh, it's it's like having a really smart person riding shotgun with you um, uh, and telling you where to go and all the the wonderful sights and sounds that 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 you're going through, uh, but you still need to drive it um, and you need to make those decisions. I've had it described as guardrails where Go, yeah, you know, yeah. it'll, it'll help keep you within the line, so to speak, but ultimately the, somebody still has to drive pilot the car down the road kind of thing. Um, and, and you're right too, to call out the technology is getting better. So a lot of people's concept with like the automatic ability to assign labels comes from algorithmic or rules-based labeling where it's more looking for like a credit card number, which is 16 digits and starts with a four. And it might have a keyword that says visa near it. And it has an expiration date like, Oh, okay. We know what that is. It's a credit card number. It's now possible to do machine learning based classification where Microsoft has some built-in ones that can automatically detect things like harassment, offensive language, source code, resumes, and automatically detect them, but you can build your own. ML models where you can feed the system and say, here's a SharePoint site with 50 examples of the kind of document I want you to see. And if you see that again, I'm going to want you to automatically label it like this. And you can now do trainers like that. Um, they're called trainable classifiers in Microsoft information protection. So it's, it's certainly evolving. I think every company that's in this space is going to try to offer more and more and more automation, but don't pin your hopes on automation is going to enable me to not get buy-in not train my users, not get them to accept this system. Ultimately, a human being is still going to be a way better judge of this is sensitive. This is confidential than a machine is. We can train machines for a lot of scenarios, but there's still going to be that human element. Yeah, and we're definitely getting closer to context uh, as well, context definitions. Uh, there with, within SharePoint itself, there's a SharePoint syntax as well that, that sort of takes that, that concept and, and being able to pull out information, it doesn't have to necessarily lay within the same, um, uh, like if you think of a form, uh, you, you think of it, you've basically told the system exactly where on that piece of paper you need to look for that specific information. Now we're looking uh, into the, the context as well, so contextual-based um, application. Uh, there's also uh, new waves into uh, attribute-based um, as well, so being able to do controls based on, on various attributes. So where do you reside, uh, what device you're logging into, uh, what file you're, uh, what, what department you're in uh, versus um, some, some other attributes as well. So the, the different 
evolution of this is is in sight, uh, but it's constant, and we we've had to keep constant because of uh, how the the pace of change within the collaboration and productivity tools is is happening. We're we're, we're definitely keeping up pace. Um, I won't say we're we're struggling behind, um, but we you know it's it is one of those things where you do as an organization do need to keep keep track of it as well. It's really interesting. We have talked about on the show where compliance is kind of like that Venn diagram where there's stuff that is just compliance, there's stuff that is just security, and then there's an intersection. And it's interesting to hear your background coming from legal and e-discovery and then where you talked about applying and innovating new security concepts to the old way of doing things like encrypting documents instead of just having that key and one of the things that comes to mind as a lot of this ransomware and cyber attacks are happening today is when they steal that data, if that data wasn't even there to begin with and there is nothing to steal, one of the conferences that I went to a long time ago that talked about quantum computing where the, one of the concepts in, that people were doing is stealing a blob of information. And while computing standards today cannot decrypt it, quantum computing standards 10 years from now will be able to decrypt that information. So sometimes they just hold on to that encrypted blob and wait. And so what I think about as part of information protection is retention policies. And oftentimes retention is part of a compliance that that you have some sort of governance in place to not have it, but it can be a security thing too, because if the data isn't there and you don't need it, then there's nothing to protect or nothing to steal, if that makes any sense. So I think just uh, having a data retention policy and then maybe getting rid of it is also a way of, in fact, protecting the data because there's nothing there to protect, if that you are is my point. You are going to be... Uh... <laughs> Making Rachel very excited because it's a concept in e-discovery as well. If you, if you don't retain it, it, once you no longer need it, it can't be used against you, right? Kind of thing. As long as you follow the regulations that that, sure, that, that are yes, industry regulations, absolutely yes. Yeah, so don't go and delete everything. Um, but you're you're absolutely right, Andy. And and a lot of the reason why there there is a big focus on compliance at at Microsoft and the transition of the discussion not just being a security discussion is because of that and and we're starting to have conversations with organizations where we have security we have legal and we have compliance in the room at the same time because those concepts transverse all of them uh, it you know you you've, you're creating a security risk because you have so much data uh, just sitting around um, on on share share files on prem uh, you you know and legal's concerned about that because they now have to, they have an obligation to discover uh, against that and and if it's responsive to a, a litigation then they have to produce that so it, it becomes an all up um, program of uh, and as we talk through uh, through information protection and data loss prevention to organizations it's it also couples with how is your retention program is it as mature uh, the same or have have you even started uh, along with that so it may be a situation where you actually go back and say well maybe we should start cleaning up your house uh, before um, and then that will give us some insights into what you should really care about to understand your risk vectors to understand uh, where that data we should protect that data from going uh, so so certainly a part of all of that and 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 luckily for us at Microsoft it falls within our information protection and governance uh, pillar so we do see it and we do visibly and tangibly see them as 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 being um, partners in crime you know two things here that Rachel speaking just jumped out to me number one and I know this is a little bit of inside baseball but sometimes where Microsoft goes <clears throat> can be predictive of where industry trends are headed so Again, inside baseball, and I apologize, but the role I used to have, my title was I was a security and compliance technical specialist, and that's a lot. I covered information protection, I covered identity, I covered cloud security, I covered threat protection, and I couldn't be an expert in all of it. And there's all other areas of compliance that Rachel has so much experience in that I was just completely oblivious to. 
And so a recent change, and, and Rachel is one of the first sitters, holders of this new title, Rachel is a technical specialist that solely focuses on compliance. And so again, I know a little bit of inside baseball, but I think it's interesting if you want to understand like, hey, where's Microsoft putting their money at? Where do they think is important? What is a growing concern for our customers? Obviously, we need talented people like Rachel to have these conversations because customers are asking us to have them. And so for our listeners, what you can take away from that is most of our listeners are going to be, again, blue hat wearing defenders of, from an information security perspective, but you're going to see more and more of a, a cross pollination between information security and a lot of these compliance efforts, because like Rachel mentioned at the top of the show, things like CMMC are driving organizations to have to get mature in this space, to have to make investments in this space. And so this is something that you should have an awareness of and be an enabler of as well and and how you can help. When it comes to retention policies, you know, I think back to, again, my, my last company where we partnered quite a bit with the legal department, like you're talking about, Rachel. We had a compliance department specifically on compliance. And then we had a privacy officer at a director level or, or higher. And so we, we would have meetings with, with those particular folks. And anytime there was a specific policy that needed to be implemented, we always looked to them. We were the technical levers to actually implement and flip the switch and we would give some insight. But a lot of times the retention policy is more of a compliance and legal matter. Uh, so like you said, follow the regulations. But it is important for the security team to to be aware of that because, again, it's a security risk. If the data is there, it's a security risk. So I wanted to bring that up because there are methods as well within the Compliance Center for Microsoft to configure retention policies. We had a three-year retention policy on our email. And I think a lot of folks get scared. You know, it's like that hoarder mentality. Like, I, I, <laughs> if, I if it's not there anymore, then... Uh, What am I going to do? Like, how am I supposed to find it? But it's also a peace of mind. You know, like when you start throwing away stuff in your house and you start cleaning out, you're holding on to that document that's 10 years old and you start throwing it out. It's liberating because it's not there anymore. And so I think that's one way to look at it is just get rid of it, be free of it and not have to worry about it being a security risk anymore. And then one final note of advice is when you start configuring retention policies, make sure that you are confident in what you are configuring because if you flip the switch on, say, retention policies is six months for Teams direct messages, there's no getting that back. It's it's gone. So that's the whole point of retention is it's gone, so you're not retaining it. So when you flip that switch... Make sure that uh, everyone knows that you've communicated it out because you can't recover those. Yeah, and there, we also have built in some some mechanisms for review. So we, we can create policies uh, based on the retention label around uh, whether it would require a, a disposition review. Uh, so so there are there are capabilities built into M365 that, that allow for that. Just to double check, uh, depending on what type of file uh, label that that you have that that needs to be um, depo- uh, disposed of. But yeah, absolutely, uh, and and certainly the more and more conversations, I would say, through the past two years, um, it is having legal and the compliance team or the privacy team sitting in the same room with with IT. Uh, has allowed for organizations to transform faster uh, because the lack of, um, I would say lack of, but the uh, the ability to um, liaise between IT and legal and le- legal into IT, you almost need a translator. And uh, for what is available in the tool to what is what is the policy that I'm trying to achieve, and there's a language that seems to, to, to go over each of them. So having, <laughs> um, having a, a structure within uh, or a team and, and 
having Microsoft really focus in on, on compliance and having specialties uh, in that area, we are allowed to then be that translator. So I know the software, what the software can do, and I uh, fundamentally understand what organizations are trying to achieve because I was there. And so I'm able to bridge that, that translation um, for them so that we can have a more detailed conversation and we're not just talking uh, past each other because we don't understand, um, we don't understand each other. And I, and I think that has, for the past two years, um, that has been the primary function of, of more organizations deploying, uh, actually purchasing the compliance software at Microsoft because we've brought those practitioners to the table to have that conversation to understand uh, what the tool uh, can, actually, can actually do. Rachel, are there, you, I heard you mention retention labels, and we've talked about sensitivity labels earlier in the conversation as well. Are there similarities between the two? Like, what's the differences between the two for our listeners who might not be familiar? Yeah, and unfortunately, they're both la named label um, and mm -hmm. uh, get referred to them uh, similarly. Uh, so within within the data classification world, uh, we have what's called our sensitive information types. Uh, those are not physical labels, but that's a way to identify uh, whether there is something present and that something being, uh, whether it be uh, so security number um, or a passport number, anything that would identify PII or PHI or or something that you create a custom one. Uh, so the system is going to identify that. Uh, we can use that, uh, what we call SIT, uh, but a sensitive information type to, to help uh, label a sensitivity label, which is uh, the, the, the label for or what we used to refer to as Azure Information Protection uh, or Microsoft Information Protection, or if you go even further back, ADRMS, uh, Azure Directory <laughs> Rights Management Services. So there, so it, it follows uh, follows that. But sensitivity label is the the label uh, that gets applied to a file um, or now to a site, which is uh, a new feature that's been released uh, this this year. Uh, but it. it, it actually what I call a tattoos onto a file into the metadata so that other applications um, using our um, Azure Information Protection um, SDK can read that so it can see that this is the um, this file has been labeled this way and that's embedded in with the protection and, and the encryption that can follow to, a, to another application versus a retention label also uh, goes into the metadata um, of that of that file is retained uh, and then again allow us to take action um, on that. It tells the system uh, what the policy is, uh, what it needs to abide by, uh, and then you can obviously take action uh, based on that, that retention label. Can a file have both? Yes. One of each. So yep. as we kind of think long term, what are what are some of the things we we need to think about? We kind of talked early on. Don't boil the ocean. Build up your practice over time. Engage your project managers. It's a it's a really a human change and corporate culture change that you're trying to implement here. Okay, now we're we're thinking long term. What are things we need to look at there? Yeah, definitely. If you have a policy in place, reevaluate it. Um, there's a wonderful partner community that, that Microsoft has or, or other organizations that, that you may be already working with that can do assessments for you, uh, do a, a benchmark. Are we where, are we where, where we want to be, uh, where, where do we have some gaps? Um, so there's certainly, uh, don't feel like you're alone. There's wonderful community out there that can assist you with that. Uh, continuous employee awareness. Uh, I mean, we, uh, I think a lot of the security team pushes that from a cyber security, you know, the phishing emails and the um, the various um, uh, antivirus links and, and all that good stuff. Uh, but equally do that for your, your compliance uh, programs as, as well, uh, making sure you, you re um, realign them with uh, with the data protection labels that, that you have, why you have them, why it's important uh, that, that you have that. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, review your existing plans. Uh, have you accounted for the new, uh, new productivity and collaboration um, tools that are that are coming out on the market? Are your 
employees using different browsers now. Um, so that's that's another one as new browsers come out. So an Edge, a Chrome, Firefox, all of those. Uh, are you accounting for for that um, as well uh, as endpoint? Um, endpoint management uh, as well. So as people move away from the office and into their homes or they have a hybrid environment, you want to make sure that experience transverses regardless of where, they, where they're where they physically working. We want to make sure that that, um, uh, that, that follows them uh, regardless of, of where they are. So just reevaluate that based on uh, whether it's the document types, the new document types, or even their, how they're working, how your employees are working now. So one one kind of thing to tie it all together back to the beginning of the conversation here. We started the conversation kind of drawing the line between data loss prevention, information protection, data protection, and those different phrases and three-letter acronyms. Pulling it back to data loss prevention for a second, um, just as kind of an interesting note for our listeners, you can actually now take everything Rachel talked about with like those sensitivity labels and you can consume them in data loss prevention products from Microsoft or third-party products as well, because Rachel used the phrase that it's tattooed onto the file. Absolutely it is. And it's just a piece of a, it looks like a GUID that you can tell other data loss prevention tools to look for. Hey, look at the metadata of the file, look for this. And if you see it, do this thing. Uh, Microsoft's tools can do that as well. So in Office 365, there's data loss prevention tools built right in to prevent emails from going out or to prevent files from being shared externally. And yes, I know this sounds crazy, but this is actually a relatively recent addition to the service that you can now look for things like sensitivity labels and say, hey, if this is labeled confidential, don't let people share it outside the company. And you can do that now. And Microsoft also now has an endpoint data loss prevention solution. So that runs on like your actual Windows boxes. And that can do things like, hey, I'm on a Windows machine, and here's a file that's been labeled confidential. Don't let me put it on a flash drive. Don't let me upload it to a third-party cloud service that we don't use. Uh, don't let me put it on a network file share. So there's the, the pieces tie back together is my point, where we're building those defense in-depth strategies we talked about, where we've got this protection on the file, we've got this encryption, it's beautiful, it's great. Um, does all these really nice things. And then we can enlighten our other solutions to look for them as well and prevent other methods of, of exfiltration or egress or, you know, insert your favorite E word here um, and work together to really get you to a point where it's protected. Even if it did fall in the wrong hands, we're still in good shape, but let's try to prevent it from falling in the wrong hands in the first place too. So I did just want to mention that to kind of my last thought before we go and, Rachel, did you have any parting thoughts or Andy as well? For me, it, it's really to our customers that are struggling uh, with it um, because we often hear, well, it was a program we thought about a year ago, but then it, we looked at it and it was way too complex and way too difficult and we didn't know who was going to own it. Um, if, if that is the case or scenario that you're in today, uh, certainly look to your leadership um, look to the uh, the happenings that are that are everywhere with with cyber risks that that are happening and and, and certainly uh, you it will be very easy for you to make a case as to why this should be a priority for you your organization and um, I can't quote um, the the recent uh, study or um, output that happened from a report, but it was, it, I mean, basically suffice to say that a lot of organizations are, are really concerned about cyber risk and, and data exfiltration uh, being a primary uh, risk factor for them as well. So it, it is not um, and should not be something where your, your leadership says, yeah, we don't have to worry about that. Um, so it, it's definitely one of those things, get your organization certainly at the C level. Uh, get their awareness of this uh, and bring that project to light uh, because from a long-term perspective, it's, it's only going to help you um, from an organizational perspective to be more, uh, to be better protected uh, and also job security for you, quite frankly, because it is, it is not a f switch. Uh, you can't just turn it on and leave it and you're done. It is a, a constant iterative process to, uh, to manage. So, um, and to go from, you know, putting protection on your email and evolving it to creating 
team sites that have protection to creating B2B, B2C type levels of protection or to your third party cloud applications that, that um, Andy and Adam spoke about on the, the previous a podcast that is that is an evolution that takes years um, and so uh, but start where your biggest risk vector is get get your management's visibility across the organization uh, and and really start driving and, and if you have a PMO group within your organization get them involved to help drive it and, and be able to pull in uh, the various um, players around around the, the organization but but truly if, if you you're in a position where you haven't started yet or you're not quite sure or you did start but haven't finished um, certainly uh, come you know come talk to us we're happy to discuss ways to start and we have wonderful resources to help you one more plug, Andy, sorry to jump in before I know it's your turn to talk. Um, Rachel mentioned partners as well. And so certainly a lot of great resources at Microsoft. Uh, ask your Microsoft account team who they can bring to bear to talk information protection, um, whether it's Rachel or somebody who sits in her same role in, in your part of the world. Uh, they can definitely, definitely help and also connect you with resources to get deployed. But I would encourage you if you're having those conversations and you're saying we need to put this on a roadmap, we need to pull together budget for it. Let me give a huge plug for our Microsoft partners. They're amazing. That's where Rachel came from, a partner. And they they can do more like hands-on keyboard, really come in and help you get things done. And nobody has more experience than they do with actual real-world deployments at real-world customers with real-world challenges and requirements. They are the best. So if you can get some funding lined up for that, either maybe Microsoft can help fund some of it, or you know you can put some aside in your budget for next year to do it. Huge plug for partners, especially on something like this where it requires, you know, a lot of expertise. To um, I shouldn't say it requires a lot of expertise, but you will never regret using the brains of those experts to help you get going in, in that sense. So certainly consider bringing in a partner for whatever solution you deploy, whether it's Microsoft or somebody else. Um, there, there really are people doing excellent, excellent work out there. And, and one thing I've kind of noticed is there's a tendency to not think about that or not set aside budget for it or, or try to go it alone. And this is one of those things where a little bit of expertise goes a long way. So huge plug for partners like Epic and others who do a great job with this stuff. Thanks so much, Rachel, for coming on. I know compliance is such a huge beast and, you know, there's more to talk about. So hopefully we can have you back on and, and discuss more because there's definitely a lot of things that as a security practitioner myself, um, coming from a customer doing the defense side for many years, you know, compliance is kind of that place where I, I understood enough to be dangerous, but I was definitely not an expert. So having someone like you come on and, and explaining what we can do is great. So thank you so much for coming. No, thank Thanks, you for Rachel. the invite. Really appreciate it. That's our show for this week. As always, our contact information will be in the show notes if you guys have any questions or follow-up comments on the episode. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.